Christie's Auction House is one of the foremost players in the art market. Last week, Miranda Sawyer looked behind the scenes as they prepared for their busiest sales of the year. Today, we reflect on the world of international dealing, tastes in the business of art, and how they've responded to the recession. I'm back at Christie's Auction House in London, and I'm on my way to meet the head of post-war and contemporary art, Francis Uhtred. It's six weeks before his sale, and the catalogues have just arrived from the printer. Hi, Hello. Francis is Hi. Nice to meet you. Really nice to meet you. Hot off the yeah. press, and it's the glue's barely dried. So, uh, it's great. On the cover, we have the Warhol Silver Liz from 1963, which we have great expectations for. As you can see, the violet eyes are singing out. So let's open up, and we have. On the flap is an Ed Ruscha painting called Review It, Look It Over and Whatever, which I thought was quite a good uh, slogan for the sale. Andreas Gursky, a German photographer who's toured around the world. And he specialises in very, very detailed, large panoramas. panoramas yeah. Yeah. You can't quite believe how he did them. Right, I'm flicking through about, from lot 33, Cy Twombly, OK? Lot 34, Lucien Freud, Frank Auerbach. 36, Paul Arago, 37, Anish Kapoor, 41, Chris Ophili, 42, Damien Hurst. So, I mean, this is like everybody knows these names. Auction catalogues today resemble coffee table art books and are sent out to collectors around the world in advance of the auction. It's the first step in presenting a successful sale. This summer, the revenue from the three evening sales alone of old masters, impressionist and contemporary paintings will make up more than a quarter of Christie's annual profits. People always look at the sales here as a barometer of where the market stands and so we have a responsibility to make sure that we maximise the prices for everything, not just for our buyers and sellers but also for the market in general. How accurate is this barometer of the art market in predicting or establishing trends? Auction houses have learnt from experience that when the art market is hit by recession they need to adapt very quickly. President of Christie's Europe, Yusip Bulkanen. Well, as we saw financial problems arising in the global economy, so we understood that there might be a reticence to buy certain works of art by certain artists and certain categories which we'd seen slowing down. We were very careful as to which type of objects we took for sale. We've been very clear with owners and said, look, you know, at the moment this work might struggle. Perhaps you should sell a less significant work, but where we know there's more of a market. It's been very, very difficult, you know. In May 08, you know, we were just running around and phones were ringing off the hook and sellers wanted to sell amazing works from the history of art. I mean, really outstanding things. And then in January 09, the phone wasn't ringing. Nobody was doing anything. An expert who's been observing the international art market since the 1980s is the editor of Art and Auction magazine, Judd Tully. In the 80s, there was a run-up in prices. There was a huge financial crisis I think it was in October of 1987 where real estate went down, everything went down, but the art market went up. The art world has been staggered by last night's record price for a painting, almost £25 million for Vincent van Gogh's sunflowers, more than three times higher than the previous world record for a single work of art. Million at £22 million. £500,000 for the last time. In the midst of this at auctions, you would see a row of Japanese men in suits bidding, and they would account for, you know, 40% of an evening Impressionist modern sale. The Japanese are buying. I guess it's good. And the backstory, which didn't come out until later, is that not all of it, but quite a bit of it was just about money laundering and they were just cooking the books with art purchases. Twenty years after the Impressionist boom, there was a second boom in contemporary art. Journalist Sarah Thornton. I think one of the reasons for the art boom between, you know, 2004 and early 2008 was what was going on in the financial markets. You know, there were a lot of people making a killing. Yeah. There was so much cash, and people didn't know where to put it. And so they were putting it into art, and they really didn't care whether they paid 10 or $15 million because they had so much. The famous portrait of Elizabeth Taylor by Andy Warhol is sold at auction in New York for more than $20 million. Christie's would not confirm rumours that it was sold by the actor Hugh Grant. Selling this side, all done, at $21 million. 
It was bought in 2001 for two and a half million pounds and has now been sold for 11 and a half million. That's a whopping 360% return. Real estate will always denominate in the currency of its location. You buy something in Mayfair, it's going to denominate in pounds. But if you buy a Warhol, you can sell it off in Hong Kong dollars, Swiss francs, American dollars, whatever the coolest and hippest currency is next year. Yeah, well, I think the contemporary market brought in these very young kind of, I don't know, you call them hedgies, but these guys that their business is taking risks with other people's money, mostly. So they loved the contemporary art market because they could study it and they believed that they figured out who was hot. It would be uh, Takashi Murakami, Richard Prince. They would buy them and, oh, you know, it went up 26% since our last sale. And, but the big difference with art, it's not liquid. If you want to sell it, you can't just call up your broker and say, sell my shares. It's a process, and you might be stuck with it. Who would you say are the big artists for auction houses then? I mean, Warhol, obviously. The boom artists were Warhol, Hearst, Coons, Richard Prince, those kind of pop artists. I think because their prices soared so high during the boom, the auction houses were reticent to bring them to market during the recession because the sellers expectations around price were far too high. And so one of the strategies the auction houses came up with during the recession was to bring to market all sorts of artists who hadn't been overinflated or overhyped. I'm Matthew Slotover. I'm one of the directors of Freeze Art Fair. You do see artists who are very successful in auction who don't have major museum careers. And sometimes I wonder if those values can be sustainable. But in a way, you've, you've almost got two different world here. And I think that's one of the tensions that occurs in the art world, certainly among artists, where they just see this disparity and think the art market is evil or corrupt or stupid. But I think everyone's got to understand there are very different measures of value. The most significant artists are not necessarily the most expensive ones. Appreciation of contemporary art may be spreading, but there are still some limitations. My name is Dasha Zakova, and I'm the founder of the Garage Center of Contemporary Culture in Moscow. In February of last year, we showcased works from the Francois Pino collection, and one of those works was by McCarthy and Kelly. We had to bring in a tremendous amount of butter, and when the truck carrying the work reached customs, we had a really big problem because we were told we can understand that such a thing as contemporary art exists, they said, we know butter and we know art, and this is definitely butter. I think attitudes in the cities are definitely changing toward contemporary art. Hopefully that'll reach the borders as well. Despite the fact that the world has become more open towards contemporary art, actually, there's only a few contemporary artists that are going to sell well in auction. Is a painting and sculpture market for the most part. I mean, one thing that really doesn't sell is left-wing politics. One of the poorest sellers for Warhol were his portraits of Mao Zedong. Mm-hmm. couldn't sell them for love nor money. I mean, could he now, now sell them? they're huge hits, but that has to do with the rise of the Asian market. It's interesting to me that some of the favorite auction artists are artist entrepreneurs, like Damien Hirst and Jeff Koons. Yeah. It's almost as if the collector businessman likes to kind of see himself mirrored in the activities of his favorite artist. Yeah, that's really interesting because they're essentially about business and sexy business, aren't they, as well as being about art. It takes four to six months to gather the artwork from around the world and plan each sale. The auction world revolves around fixed sale seasons, which are coordinated so buyers can attend several sales at once. At the height of summer, that means up to four exhibitions a week will go on display in Christie's main gallery. I met Head of Operations David Gregory in the middle of the most challenging installation of all, the Contemporary Art Show. What time do we start this morning? About 8 o'clock. Tell me what you've been doing. People don't always realise how much goes on in the background to get their exhibitions up and on view. And then, of course, take it all down for the sale and start on the following one. 
Come forward slightly if you can that way. If you can't, I mean, this is very definitely curated in that you've got a YBA area. You've got this area of art that I'm not so familiar with, which is what we might call emerging, emerging yeah. art, but actually looks really nice together. Different mediums as well, which is interesting. So you've got this that Matthew Day Jackson uses found materials. This is an incredible object. It's almost four metres long. Chris right, Feely, who won the Turner Prize in 98. Yeah, I um, remember it. It's beautiful, that painting. Franz is still working out what the plan's going to be in here, but um, the clock's ticking.